Thank you again once again, Marie. And I uh, hope people are staying awake after lunch. I'll try not to put you to sleep if I can help it. So, so I think uh, with some of the eloquent words that Sister just share, shared with us with regards to the, the whole concept of recollection with our Lord's presence, I think is a tremendous opportunity for us in healthcare. And I think with, to be a, a, a tremendous intercessor for our patients, uh, we have to have this uh, heightened awareness or recognition. And so once again, before any uh, provider may provide, bring forth healing, there must be an awareness for the patient's illnesses and concerns, just very pretty basic. But to take time to listen to patients and their families, as I'm sure each of you strive to do each day, and then to closely observe patients' cases. It's a tremendous opportunity, of course, to review medical records, physical exam, lab results, and various imaging studies. But as we all, I think, recognize here, that uh, in order to recognize how uh, illness affects the whole person, of course, not just their physical being, as we all know, the emotional and psychological state, the social well-being, as well as the spiritual being. But there are consequences to these failures of recognition. Obviously, we worry about missed or wrong diagnoses if we're not paying attention. Uh, delayed time to treatment for sometimes stumbling around. Um, uh, inferior patient outcomes and shortened survival. Patient anxiety when we're not paying attention to them. Loss of trust from patients. And of course, patient and family dissatisfaction. I, uh, through my talks, as Marie said, I sort of work with, uh, as a hematologist, I work a lot, as I think a number of you know, with regards to bone marrow transplantation and the immune system uh, is a critical part of that. And this slide, uh, just for those who aren't familiar with the immune system, I'll use this a little bit in the background, of just so I think for basic principles. But ordinarily in life, we have this balanced state of what we call homeostasis, where there's uh, new cells being produced, old cells dying off in our, in our bodies. But with regards to the immune system, there are various things that could be either an internal threat to it or an external threat to the being that the immune system has to deal with. Now, if the immune system is overreactive uh, from an external threat, for instance, an allergic reaction, when you have hay fever or exposed to some drug or um, sinusitis, something like that, you have this overreaction uh, uh, and you get hives, for instance, or, or fever. Uh, from an internal threat, some of the autoimmune conditions we may consider like type 1 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, multiple sclerosis, um, where the balance is disrupted, but it's once again more from an internal threat, not some external source. On the flip side, there are problems where the immune system is actually underreactive, and uh, from an external threat point of view, various infections. Normally, our, as you know, our, our immune system does a nice job warding off the bacteria and fungi of the world that surround us all over our bodies. But once again, if the immune system is not quite there, uh, up to par, uh, infections can set in and be life-threatening. And of course, from an internal threat, in, in my field, we worry about various cancers. Because our immune system is floating around not just attacking bacteria and fungi, but throughout life, people's uh, bad cells are formed in our bodies at times and the immune system often eradicates that but if that fails to happen there's this growth advantage and a cancer can develop when i think about external threats if we go back for those who i love the as you read through the bible studies uh there again in the, the second book of maccabees there's a, a brilliant story um uh, just a uh, tremendous witness where the martyrdom of a mother with her seven sons and for those who aren't familiar she was uh, arrested they were arrested and tortured by the green Greek king Antiochus uh, Epiphanes to force them to eat pork in violation of God's law. And as the mother witnessed her son's death uh, one by one, um, she said, I do not know how you came into existence in my womb. It was not I who gave you the breath of life, nor was it I who set in order the elements of which each of you is composed. Therefore, since it is the creator of the universe who shapes each man's beginning as he brings about the origin of everything, he in his mercy will give you back both breath and life because you now disregard yourselves for the sake of his law. So I think this is a beautiful prefigurement to what our Blessed Mother uh, encountered, of course, as she witnessed the death of her innocent child, looking with the eyes of faith for the far greater good um, with this tremendous gift of faith again, and then hope for that which we cannot see as our Blessed Mother did with the resurrection. St. Thomas Aquinas was one of his famous quotes. I shared one yesterday. This is another one that I love. It says, to, to one who has faith, no explanation is necessary. And to one without faith, no explanation is possible. So it is a tremendous gift that we sometimes can take for granted 
and shouldn't. Back to the immune system, though, um, not to bore you with a lot of details, but for, the, for inside our bone marrow, if you look at the earliest blood stem cells, they go down one of two pathways, either a myeloid pathway, which makes our platelets and red blood cells and various white blood cells, and the lymphoid pathway on the right, which I'm going to focus on a little bit today with some parts of my talk. Um, the lymphoid pathway, you can go down to one of three paths, either make B lymphocytes called B cells or T lymphocytes or natural killer cells. And these are an important part of our immune system. Uh, if you will, sometimes, uh, like the T cells, for instance, are considered sometimes like the generals in the immune system. They direct the other uh, guys around. I briefly touched upon yesterday a case with a gentleman with a, a lymphoma, and I wanted to use a, a couple of these, a few of these slides are from my colleague, Dr. Hill, at the Cleveland Clinic, who's the director of our lymphoma program, so I'd like to acknowledge him for letting me borrow a few of his slides. But uh, with regards to the many types of lymphomas, they're, they're broadly cast, categorized into non-Hodgkin's lymphomas and Hodgkin's lymphomas. And so about two-thirds of the lymphoid cancers out there are consist of non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, and of that group, um, the most common one is a type called diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, which I'll share a couple more insights with as we talk, go through this talk. It's about 30,000 cases per year, and this is considered an aggressive lymphoma. Now, if you don't treat this lymphoma in general, people can pass away within a couple years or less. But uh, if you do treat it, once again, as I shared yesterday with the one story, uh, since this uh, disease is a bit more kinetically active, the cells take up chemotherapy reasonably well, at least a number of them, and you can cure a number of them. So you certainly have to treat, but if you, if you do, there's no 100% guarantee, but there is uh, potential hopes for cure. Now, for those who aren't, ex aren't in pathology field, basically it's a clonal expansion of some of the mature B cells that I just showed on the first slide. And it's often, again, an aggressive clinical course in either nodal sites, like the lymph node sites, or extranodal sites that can spread to the, the bone, the liver, various organs outside of the lymph nodes. It may be associated with things called B symptoms that basically are things like fevers, night sweats, weight loss, these constitutional symptoms. And it's usually, as I mentioned just a minute ago, usually highly responsive to traditional chemotherapy. The picture on the right bottom is what we call a PET scan for those who aren't familiar, uh, basically taking up uh, radioactive particle, taking up uh, areas of uh, increased metabolism, and this person has widespread uh, lymphoma, all these uh, black spots that are lighting up. Now, for many years, a, a classic treatment uh, since back in the 1980s, a regimen called the CHOP regimen, C-H-O-P, cyclophosphamide, uh, doxorubicin, vincristine, and prednisone, and as the, as the deers went on for like 20 years, people tried tons of different regimens, different, if you will, recipes, putting different drugs together, and nothing was ever shown to be better. It might have caused more toxicity, there could have been many more drugs, longer treatments, but nothing was better than this regimen that withstood the test of time for about 20 years. And when you use that regimen, there are many different groups of people with large cell lymphoma, but if you look at this survival curve, about half the people were cured. The other half are not, and those are the people that we still need to uh, think about, of course. But I think in the spiritual realm, when we deal with the high, highly effective therapy for the cancer of sin, uh, how do we, uh, over the years, I think the traditional things still hold up pretty well with regards to prayer, fasting, almsgiving, and trust, complete trust in the Lord's divine mercy. I'll call it the PFAT regimen, but regard to, uh, with those initials, but there, there's been no regimen more effective for thousands of years and the survival curve over there is a 100% is cure rate for those who embark upon treatment. Of course, you have to be willing to undergo the treatment. Now, the one changed in, in, the, in the field of medicine, I mentioned for about 20 years, this CHOP regimen was a standard of care. And then um, uh, as the years went by, uh, an immune therapy called rituximab was the first one designed in the 1990s. And basically, for those who aren't familiar with an antibody, some of them are, uh, uh, it's basically, if you will, uh, is some of the white blood cells, the lymphoid cell family are called plasma cells, and they make antibodies for us. And they're almost like a red flag that sticks on to various foreign things, like a bug or bacteria. And other parts of the immune system sees the thing with a red flag on it, and they attack it and kill it. So uh, rituximab was a, a designed to stick onto a marker on lymphocytes called CD20. And when you did that, uh, if you added that to this regimen, basically it, it sh there was various different ways that it could kill uh, cancer cells. Uh, with, uh, I'm not going to bore you with all the scientific details, but there are different methods of action. 
But if you combine it with the CHOP regimen, all of a sudden it improved outcomes. This is published back in 2005. I remember the presentation years ago from a French group, the JLA study. And basically they showed that where for many years the survival had been parked at 50%. Just adding this simple outpatient antibody, you could improve response rates about another 10%. So we're up to about 60% cure rate. So it's better. Oh, sorry. Now, as the years went by, for people trying to risk stratify, if you will, um, why do some people with large cell lymphoma do really well and some people don't do the best? And if they looked at various different prognostic factors and came up with an index called the International Prognostic Index, or the IPI, and the things they took into consideration are patients, age, age, age greater than 60 was a, a one negative point. If your performance status was uh, less, uh, was, there's four performance, to zero, you have 100% performance, great, you're in great shape, four being pretty much on your deathbed. So those with higher performance statuses got a point. If they had an elevated LDH in the bloodstream, if their stage of disease was more advanced, stage three or four, or if they had more than one extra nodal site outside of the lymph node areas. And as you can see in the slide, if you tally up those points, one to five, those who had a score of zero or one, had close to a 90% cure rate with this CHOP chemotherapy regimen. Um, if you had two, you know, your survival went down about 80%. But when you started having more and more of these adverse features, uh, the survival dropped down to about 50%. So if we take that paradigm into our spiritual development, risk stratification for the cancer of sin, I like to think of the world eternal prognostic index. And there again, there's some basic big points to consider to, to give you adverse features. One at the top of the list, unwillingness to repent, lack of trust in the Lord's goodness and mercy. Then you can tally up all the other mortal sins you want and all the other venial sins and have this massive list, far more than five points. And although one can have an extremely high score, there still can have 100% cure rate, except for those, as Father Chris mentioned yesterday, who blaspheme the Holy Spirit and continue to reject our, our loving Lord God's mercy and goodness, the unforgivable unforg sin. So how do we approach those patients who have relapsed large cell lymphoma? Um, well, second line treatment, usually you have a platinum containing regimen. Um, for patients who have chemotherapy sensitive disease, after you treat them and they're responding, then you can actually take them on to high dose chemotherapy, what we call an autologous blood stem cell transplant. It's still potentially curative. And this was a famous study called the PARMA study back in the New England Journal of Medicine back in the 1990s, where they showed that those people who relapsed um, if you just gave them conventional chemotherapy, you know, at best, maybe a third of people might get some mileage. But if you took them onto this transplant procedure, all of a sudden you had a little over a 50% cure rate. So around a 50% cure rate. So it, it, it still was optimistic for some, but not for all. So how do we re approach rel a relapse of the cancer of sin? And I like to think a divine mercy transplant is the, the way to do that and inundating our entire being with the Lord's infinite graces and goodness for, is really what's required for definitive healing. And with the hope of 100% cure rate, as long as we cooperate with the Lord's graces. Now when we think about relapsed or refractory large cell lymphoma, although I showed you, you know, initially, if you give rituximab and CHOP chemotherapy, a number of people will be cured, but about 20 to 30% are gonna have relapsed or refractory disease. If you go on and give them more chemotherapy and transplant them, about 50% are gonna be cured. But there's still, um, if you look at this survival curve, those who had prior rituximab, those of the group in, in the uh, yellow, they still have a pretty dismal survival curve, most of them dying within a very short period of time. And those who uh, didn't have prior rituximab in the blue, is still only about half of them are cured. So we have a lot of work to do in the oncology career. <coughs> But despite years of clinical trials, there's un unfortunately there's been no FDA approved therapies for diffuse large B cell from 1997 to 2017. And treatment has largely been palliative for these folks with very few long-term survivors. But cellular immunotherapy represents a novel treatment approach for this previously unmet need. Now how do we potentially consider that? Well, in some other cancers, uh, the, the whole thought of cancer vaccines, where you get a part of the person's tumor or their cancer, and there's various markers on the cell surfaces called antigens or epitopes. And in the lab, they're going to, you, you construct uh, vaccines. And what you're trying to, using some of those markers to try to enhance the patient's own immune response, once again, because uh, it's failing to recognize this as foreign. Unfortunately, I can't see that has been a success story for lymphomas, but it's one immunologic approach, if you will. 
Now, I, I showed this slide earlier with cells of the immune system, and I highlight here the guys called the natural killer cells, because some other blood cancers, this is an area of a lot of active research, one that I've been blessed to have been part of. But um, when you think of natural killer cells, um, they have a certain receptor called cures or killer immunoglobulin-like receptors, and they regulate the activity of these natural killer cells. So I have three scenarios here. The first one on, your, on my left here, they're, they're, first of all, there's two receptors. Some are inhibitory, and the other ones are called activating receptors. So the inhibitory receptors is this NK cell encounters a, a foreign target cell, if you will, um, as they bind through this ligand. If they recognize, if there's this uh, recognition, if you will, uh, there's no cell killing because it recognizes sort of like this self. I don't attack my own body. But on the other hand, in the middle scenario, where there's not a, a, a lack of recognition, there, this, this inhibitory receptor doesn't engage, and the NK cells, this guy is not part of me, it's foreign, and it attacks it and kills it. And then there are other activating killer immunoglobulin-like receptors from the get-go, and they uh, sense a foreign cell, they just attack it and kill it. So it's a very active area of research. Um, I can't say that it's been a standard thing for lymphoma, but uh, certainly an area where people are focusing with regards to the immune system. Another area, getting back when I showed that slide before, various T cells or T lymphocytes, some are memory cells, some are helper cells. It's probably not important to memorize the details, but once again, these are some of the guys like the generals in our immune system to help direct the immune system. So if we take that entity called an antibody, and a T cell receptor and fuse them together, there's a thing called a chimera. And you may have heard about this on the news the last few years. This has been a lot of area research uh, in terms of um, a newer therapy called CAR T cells. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time, just give you a couple summary points as we go on with the talk. But the advantages of this cellular immunotherapy, the T cells can actually function as serial killers of various targets. So you can genetically modify these things to attack cancer cells. So the T cells also, as the generals, they recruit additional parts of the immune system to come in to help uh, eradicate things by one way is re releasing cytokines, almost like mini hormones to direct the other parts of the immune system to come to the area. And the, the fancy word is called uh, CAR or chimeric antigen receptors combined with these T cells can then be directed um, against selected markers on the malignancies. This is a busy slide, but just the general principle is you take some blood from the patient's uh, peripheral blood, and then you, uh, if you will, in the lab, mix it with either the viral or non-viral <coughs> construct to insert a gene into that, if you will, to, to come up with this chimeric antigen receptor. So there again, this, this can, in, in fact, then recognize the cancer cells that you're trying to address, and then you infuse these cells back in the patients. Um, there are many generations, of, if you say first, second, and third generations, I couldn't find a good slide with this, but I've seen some other people have these old cars, like a first generation car, they have like an old World Royce from the 1920s, and then as you move on to your Porsches up the ladder to second or third generation cars. But basically, as the, the, the generations got more advanced, they add on co-stimulatory molecules to sort of rev up the immune response to make it even a better attacker, if you will, of these cancer cells. So just to summarize, so you have the patient, you take some of their T cells, you um, then engineer them to express these chimeric antigen receptors that recognize the cancer cells pretty well, and uh, then they're modified and grown in culture, expanded, and then you just basically infuse them back in the patient. And this therapy was really, we're now got a lot of hype on the news. Um, there are three groups here. I'm not reading line by line in this, don't worry. But there are three groups, University of Pennsylvania, Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York, and the National Cancer Institute, and they all took a, a number of, if you will, younger adults or children with um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia that really was not responding to other therapies. And when you gave this CAR T cell therapy, this enhanced immune therapy, uh, basically you had results of from anywhere from two thirds to 90% of people going in these deep remissions, which was unheard of. These people otherwise are on their deathbed sometimes. So it really was a, a wonderful uh, blessing, if you will, for, for our field. So when we think about this enhanced recognition, I think we're called to that in, in, in general in our medical practices, whatever discipline we are, with regards to the mindfulness. Are we aware of results from the medical, medical literature? Which patients does the research apply to? Doesn't apply to everybody just because it works in uh, lymphoma doesn't mean it's going to work in lung cancer. Was the study of good design and scientific rigor or was it flawed? Um, 
what were the limitations of the studies that we need to keep in mind when discussing these therapeutic options with our patients? And have we considered whether therapy is morally acceptable before offering it to patients? So a lot of things to bear in mind. Um, just a couple more basic science talks, not, not too much, but with regards to that therapy I mentioned, there are some significant potential side effects, and one's called cytokine release uh, syndrome, where the cytokines, again, are these little mini hormones, if you will, and as they're showered or released into the system from this in therapy, they can result in clotting, a septic shock-like appearance, lung injury, renal failure, or even, cell, even um, various forms of cell death. When that occurs, uh, some patients it's very mild, just like flu-like symptoms with a low-grade fever, or myalgias, and a headache, which can be managed with Tylenol and just supportive care measures. But others, if it's more moderate to severe, they can have this vascular leak or hy hypotension and can be life-threatening. There is an effective therapy called tocilizumab, which I won't bore you with the details, but it's a, a blocker of interleukin-6 receptor. And if you have to, you can give steroids uh, as well. So, it's the schema that I've shown on the other sides. This slide basically is just showing that, yes, it's a very elegant approach. It's not available at a lot of centers, um, but it's an extremely expensive therapy. And, and just for one patient, it could be over $600,000. And the people ask, well, where, where's this going to help? With the healthcare budget, we already have our issues. So even if you can potentially cure one patient, you know, uh, from a, you know, when I'm looking at my patient, you know, that, that person means the world to me, but for the rest of the population looking at, could I feed like a, you know, a family for about five years or, you know, so it is a, a, a big issue out there in general thinking about where the money should go in the country. But as an opportunity to enhance spirit, uh, spiritual immunity, I think there are parallels here as always. If we think, once again, on the left, a patient with refractory leukemia or lymphoma, they may, although they failed all these other therapies, they still may be very responsive to this novel immune therapy with potential for prolonged survival, treatment-related complications aren't minimal, and it's very expensive. But from the spiritual domain, the Lord can modify and perpetually sustain our spiritual defenses against any sin. Of course, it requires our repentance, acceptance of his divine mercy, and cooperating, of course, with the Lord's graces and of tremendous help, of course, is consecration to our Immaculate, Immaculate Heart of Mary. And it's spiritually costly. $600,000 is one thing, but as, as we've heard from other talks, uh, it's all or nothing with the Lord. It's, I, we can completely give ourselves, as the children of Adam did, away trusting and living in his divine will. Not too long ago, I think, for the Daily Mass uh, folks, we had this reading with St. John's Gospel, which I love. It's, this is the way. Uh, Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, then you will also know my Father. So can others we encounter in our daily work lives out in medicine see that we too are a way to the definitive way? And just following that up in St. John's Gospel, uh, the Lord went on and he said, Jesus said, if you know me, then you will also know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Master, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you for so long a time, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own. The Father who dwells in me is doing his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe because of the works themselves. So I think sometimes when we think about our, our Lord, if you think of, um, if you will, a, a family where they have a newborn baby, and they, so a tremendous compliment to a parent to hear, boy, that, that, that little one looks just like you as a reflection. So there's this tr tremendous resemblance sometimes that, from, that we have with our children or our parents. Um, and uh, there again, not everyone may see it right away, but if you look with the eyes of faith, it's certainly there. So how is our recognition in the medical world? Do we recognize Jesus and the Father and others, as Sister was sharing, and in our patients and in their families, colleagues, and just our other healthcare providers we're working with next to us 20 or 30 years, the same person, the same job, same boring jokes. You know, so, so just there again, do we see the face of the Lord right there next to us? And more, just as importantly, can others recognize Jesus and the Father from our lives? Do we have this recognition? 
St. Faustina, my hero, also said, you know, she was blessed beyond belief, and I, I, those who haven't read the diary, it's just one of these things you perpetually read. Um, but with regards to, as she was blessed, to, to, if you will, with the Lord, to experience the sufferings he underwent during his passion and death, she was absolutely horrified and gazed lovingly at the Lord and said, you know, nothing escaped my notice. So once again, this recognition or notice, the small attention to detail. Someone, one of the talks earlier this morning are, um, with regards to a mother, you know, they, they, I think Father Kasser was last night, he was saying, you know, you don't have to be a doctor, you know there's something wrong with that child, they have a cold, you just have this heightened sense of awareness. Everybody else in the room is completely oblivious to the matter that this kid has a fever, it's just about to uh, hit. So there again, do we have that awareness for others, especially as healthcare providers? Do we take time to notice their suffering? I mean, this is a day and age, people across the world, we're, we're in a small world with the internet and everything, that we can't be, say we're removed. It's, besides our patients, there's trauma every day throughout the world that our prayers are so vitally needed for. See the face of the Lord right there in front of us. Do we clearly recognize what the world needs for true peace and happiness? Our Lady's peace, a plan of peace from Fatima. As Sister elegantly discussed, I won't do it too much today, just a few slides, sorry. So uh, with, with regards to making reparation for the sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary, uh, Sister shared with this earlier as well, but after uh, Jacinta and uh, Francisco passed on, um, there again, Sister Lucia still was blessed uh, to have encounters, and particularly this one in, in December uh, 10th, 1925, the Ch Christ child spoke to her, said, have pity on the heart of your most holy mother. It is covered with thorns with which ungrateful men pierce it at every moment, and there is no one to remove them with an act of reparation. So how often can you and I encounter our struggling colleagues and patients and their families who are sometimes deeply suffering spiritually who could use our offerings of whatever they may be? The first Saturdays, as we know, has been of critical importance. And the Blessed Mother said, My child, behold my heart surrounded with thorns which ungrateful men place there, and at every moment by their blasphemies and ingratitude, you at least try to console me. I think she speaks these words to each of us uh, as believers as well. And she went on to say, Announce in my name that I promise to assist at the hour of death with all the graces necessary for salvation, all those who on the first Saturday of five consecutive months go to confession, receive Holy Communion, recite the Holy Rosary, and keep me company for a quarter of an hour while meditating on the mysteries of the Holy Rosary with the intention of making reparation to me. One of my uh, friends and colleagues, Reginald, um, had a devout practice. He's a physician also who made a practice of not only keeping the Most Blessed Mother's company on the first Saturday every month, but he did this every Saturday, uh, taking time to reflect for reparation and for, for, uh, for sin and the conversion of all souls, including his patients. He often meditated on the mysteries of the rosary a lot longer than 15 minutes. Uh, at the minimum, after St. John Paul II announced the luminous mysteries, um, it, there was automatically another 20 minutes instead of 15 minutes because you have five more um, dec decades to, or uh, mysteries to consider. And as our Blessed Mother shared what she wanted, consecration. And I, I thought a nice definition in the New American Bible in the glossary, it's uh, for consecration it's defined as withdrawal of an object or person from the secular use so as to transfer it into the domain of God and keep it there. It is a beautiful thing to consider for each of us and our families. So our Blessed Mother's words with consecration, as we've heard a number of times, consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary by the Pope, personal consecration to the Her Immaculate Heart, giving to Mary all our thoughts, words, actions, sufferings, possessions, and the merits for all, that we, all the good we do, that she may use them as she best sees fit for reparation for sin, further conversion of poor sinners, and for the greater love and honor and glory of Almighty God. And true devotion of the Blessed Virgin Mary is preached by St. Louis de Montfort. It's there been uh, just a, a pillar for the church. A lot of the popes, including St. John Paul II. And I think many of you are familiar with Dr. Father Gately's beautiful book, uh, 33 Days Mor to Morning Glory, which is a magnificent work if you haven't read it. Act of Consecration and Wearing the Scapular. Just a constant reminder of one's personal consecration of the Blessed Mother and of the necessity of imitating her virtues and heeding her requests. 
I showed this slide earlier about the balanced immune system, not to belabor it again, but we earlier showed about external threats, but there are certainly internal threats, not only to our physical being, but to our spiritual being, that I think a lot of us, regardless what state of life or what uh, uh, vocation we have, people can certainly, uh, and life's hard out there, despondency can happen, lukewarmness, hatred and despair. And of course, the seven deadly sins of pride, envy, lust, anger, greed, gluttony, and a obtuse spirit. So as we contemplate, once again, our immune system's doing tremendous things, surveilling around and putting out fires, if you will, and eradicating things. But even, if, even in the spiritual domain, even if sin cannot be completely eradicated during one's uh, life, if it's markedly suppressed and controlled, one can grow in holiness to great levels of sanctity. Um, years ago, Father Patrice uh, was speaking up here, and he said a lot of the saints didn't start out well, but they all finished well. And that was a beautiful reflection, so there's hope for all of us. Um, but just acknowledging our sinfulness helps us to humble ourselves and to recognize our constant need for God's mercy. If we didn't fall and didn't ask him for mercy, I, I think there would be a, a, quite an insult to our Lord. So in cancer, we're always using this word, the, the war against cancer, if you will, but we need to do this innovation in our war against sin. Are we open to fresh approaches? The Lord provides countless opportunities to experience his mercy and grow in holiness throughout our lifetimes. And do we look for these new ways to serve God and others? Do we regularly perform spiritual exercises, as we shared earlier, the prayer, almsgiving, fasting, and other mortifications? And do we seek spiritual nourishment for the journey, sort of like you're doing today at this conference? Above all, the source and summit of our prayer life, of course, is Catholics, the Most Holy Mass, the sacraments and of critical importance, contemplative and formal prayer, as Sister shared with us, and spiritual reading, to know the life of Christ, if we're to imitate his example. And do we seek out and obey spiritual direction? With regards to examination of conscience, a lot of people reflect throughout the day, but as, as people of faith, I think it's always important, even if it's a few minutes at the end of the day, we've been taught by tremendous role models throughout the church history. You know, what have I done well by God's grace today? Where have I fallen into sin? And am I willing to repent and make amends for the wrong that I've done? It's just this constant cycle. But with this proper recognition, once again, um, don't be a hypocrite. It's like the, the classic uh, teaching of our Lord, remove the bean first from my own eye in order to see clearly, remove the speck from my brother's eye. So really that balance in life, of course, decreasing my criticisms of others, which is sometimes very hard to do, and increasing the focus on that which needs to be changed in my own life. I think as people of attention to detail, once again, this heightened awareness in our life, not only to our immune, immune responses, but just as people of faith, how can we help others in need? Sometimes just doing menial tasks, such as picking up garbage, I mean, picking up a piece of a scrap of paper in the church parking lot, no one will see that, but perform works that no one sees them but Almighty God. I think St. Faustina, a lot of the great saints did that, not to advertise, but the Lord knew what she was doing with that little act of love, a tremendous benefit. And take notice of the other, uh, it is an opportunity for us to take notice of little things others do. As our Lord pointed out, the poor widow putting the two coins in the temple treasury, he wasn't trying to you know, humiliate her or take away her humility, if you will, but just to show us a wonderful model for each of us to follow. So do we recognize when, when the Lord is trying to teach us? The old adage, something old, something new. There's always something new to learn from the parables in our priest's homilies. I mean, we go through this cycle every three years, or at a different point in our lives each time we hear them. And the Lord may have us hear things again and again on our spiritual journey as we move from time, time throughout history to further strengthen our own faith and that of others. But I think uh, constantly called in, the, in, uh, as we, in medicine to be good observers. It's nice to act and speak, but just to sit and listen and to be present for others. And as you watch them and listen to patients, there are best professors, I think, who watch and learn from them. How do they work? How do they pray? What is the Lord trying to teach me from them? So each individual person you encounter throughout the day, whether it be in medicine or at home or in the grocery store, just an opportunity for growth. Um, there was a, uh, I heard this one talk, there was a gentleman from China saying, using one of Confucius's old saying, if you walk in a room with one man, there's two other people, there's, there's always uh, two other people to learn from something tremendous. And, and I think I mentioned yesterday, just watching my mother as a little boy praying the rosary, just a tremendous influence on my life. As a teenager, I may not have completely appreciated it at the time, 
but now I uh, sincerely treasure it. It's in self-awareness, as you and I reflect on ourselves, you know, what are our strengths? Am I living up to my full potential? If not, am I willing to change and be flexible? Do I realize that others are watching me? And am I concerned how my example may affect others' lives and how they live? So there's truly opportunities to take notice. Um, when we drive by, for instance, a church, take time to stop for a visit before the Blessed Sacrament, or at least reverently make the sign of the cross. Um, do we notice the God of heaven and earth in Eucharist adoration? I mean, some people think it would be tremendous if I could have been there uh, with the Lord at the Sermon of the Mount, but in our very chapels, we're right there at our Lord's feet. I think there was one example I'd like to just briefly share a failure to notice. Uh, there was a guy named Rick that I helped take care of many years ago. He was a gentleman with a blood cancer being evaluated for a bone marrow transplant. And during his pre-transplant assessment, uh, people noted that he periodically alcohol binge drink, not, not r real routinely, and he suggested maybe he should think about an re alcohol rehab program. But the patient refused, just minimizing, saying, no, it's not a problem. And Rick, so he got through and everything else looked okay. And he underwent his transplant and initially was recovering well, but months later developed a complication called graft versus host disease, had some hospitalizations and other complications. And then one night I got a phone call from the police department in the middle of the night that Rick shot himself. So um, it turned out that this was his coping strategy, taking away the alcohol. And um, there again, it created a lot of uh, changes in our transplant programs years ago in terms of being much more rigorous about making people go through programs for rehab, if you will. So it was really an opportunity to intercede and continue our care. And I thought about this, and many of you may be familiar with the wonderful practice of Gregorian masses, where you have 30 daily masses, $10 per day, if you will, $300. And I was at one of Dr. Thatcher's conferences years ago, and uh, there was a lady that came up to me, and she, she, she was, we were talking about that, and she said, you know, when I die, I told my kids, here's the $300. Before you cry for me, before you make any few arrangements, you give me those three at, at Gregorian <laughs> uh, So, uh, But also the powerful prayer of the Chaplain of the Divine Mercy and the Holy Rosary. And I think many of you are familiar also the powerful prayer that our Lord gave St. Gertrude the Great uh, to release a thousand souls for purgatory. I think this is a win-win situation. Eternal Father, I offer thee the most precious blood of thy divine Son, Jesus, in union with the masses said throughout the world today for all the holy souls in purgatory, for sinners everywhere, for sinners in their universal church, those in my own home and within my family. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us of recourse to thee. So even if you're in a busy practice and somebody dies, you don't have an, you don't have a long time to say the chaplet of divine mercy, it's pretty easy to say this prayer in about 15 seconds and hopefully uh, they're going to more than hopefully definitively have an impact for them. So do not take, uh, do not fail to take time to notice. I'm not going to talk much about uh, Dr. Rollins is going to be talking about physician assisted suicide. This is just a slide from Oregon that it's a big problem. There's a lot of prescriptions given out over the past 15 years. Um, and a lot of deaths resulted in this um, suicide-based uh, or euthanasia. I don't have a lot of time to read this from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Basically, those whose lives are diminished or weakened deserve special respect. Sick or handicapped persons should be helped to lead lives as normal as possible. And whatever its motives and means, direct euthanasia consists in putting an end to the lives of handicapped, sick, or dying persons. It's morally unacceptable. Thus, an act or omission which, of itself or by intention, causes death in order to eliminate suffering constitutes a murder gravely contrary to the dignity of the human person and to, to the respect due to the living God, his creator. The error of judgment into which one can fall in good faith does not change the nature of this murderous act, which must always be forbidden and excluded. So, although I think we're very attuned with euthanasia as a, a, a threat to life, there's this spiritual euthanasia, not taking time to notice others in need. We think of the rich man and Lazarus from the, from the Lord's uh, parable in the gospel, neglecting patients and concerned family members who may be just exhausted, failure to recognize our colleagues who are struggling or perhaps showing signs of burnout. So that recognition there is, is critical uh, to help be present for those so we're not leading to their spiritual demise. But I think we're also called to not to try to do things simply for show and for others to take notice. But however, I think the Lord may help others to recognize the good that we do as an example to help them grow further in holiness as we think of our Holy Father. It's not trying to advertise, just His holiness sort of exudes, and it's a wonderful example. Um, just uh, almost there. Uh, there was a, a, same, a, a saying at one of the tennis uh, uh, um, 
uh, national tennis events on the wall, there's a saying is that hard work overcomes talent when talent does not work hard. So we think about this time in our spiritual lives, hard work from evil, and there's a lot of that out there, can work real hard, can overcome those bl blessings and talents w um, from the Lord when we do not uh, use them as intended by Almighty God. So we're really called to cooperate with the Lord's graces at all times. And with regards to further self-awareness, I think sometimes thinking St. Mark's Gospel, he was a source for St. Luke's and St. Matthew's Gospel. And are you and I willing to be a source for others to come to know the Gospel message in our healthcare environments? My last two slides, I promise. <laughs> so when we take time to notice others, can we uh, see ourselves as if looking in a mirror? I think that's always, the, as we mentioned with other people, it's an opportunity to recognize our own limitations and faults, the beam in our eye and the speck in, the, in our brother's eyes, the reminder of who we are called to be, a child of God formed in his divine image. And my last slide, Marie, um, I think with regards to, in order to intercede, to best intercede well for others, we must, once again, have this deep self-awareness and recognize who we are, that all the good we perform is from God and the intercession of our most blessed mother, the Immaculate Virgin Mary, which we honor particularly with Our Lady of Fatima. So once again, God bless you and happy Nurses Week. Thanks.